Good evening. Uh, my name is Andrew Kiesling, and I'm the Director of Stakeholder Engagement in the Lewis College of Business at Marshall University. Uh, today marks the second of our Cohen Professionalism Speaker Series for the spring 2024 semester, where we will be having a discussion on the topic of energy in West Virginia. This speaker series is an enrichment program offered by Marshall University's Lewis College of Business to allow students to form connections with classroom teachings and real world applications. The theme for this semester's program series is growth and development in West Virginia, an effort to stimulate inspirational ideas and on how we can bring more commercialization, industry and jobs back to West Virginia. Our showcase business professionals will discuss various topics, including entry level jobs and opportunities in these fields and required effort and education for success and advancement in these fields. There will be a question and answer segment at the end of this discussion, but feel free to ask any questions in the Q&A box and we will get to them at the end. Without further ado, I'll introduce our panelists. So first off, I just want to say that I'm grateful for our panelists, uh, for them to take the time out of their day to sit down with us and share their information and knowledge on this topic. And I'll start with Terry Hollinsworth. Terry is uh, currently the vice president or the president elect for the uh, West Virginia chapter of ASHRAE, and that's a global society advancing human well-being through sustainable technology for the built environment. He has an MBA in management from Liberty University and has 40 years experience in facilities maintenance, energy maintenance or energy management and, and safety environment and environmental. Next is Garrett Weaver. Garrett is an energy programs manager with the West Virginia Office of Energy. The office, the office is housed in, within the Department of Economic Development, which provides oversight in many facets throughout the state. He oversees the planning and implementation of all federally funded programs that flow down to his office. Uh, he is a graduate of Marshall University, holding two bachelor's degrees in business administration and energy management, and sits on the board of directors for the West Virginia ASHRAE chapter. Next, we have Robin Blakeman. Uh, Robin currently works full time as the director of a nonprofit uh, organization called Energy Efficient West Virginia. They work to encour uh, encourage the adoption of state and local policy that uh, enhances the energy efficiency options available to mun municipalities schools, business leaders, and individuals in West Virginia. For the past 14 years, she has worked in the nonprofit environmental advocacy sector in West Virginia, uh, helping to preserve our water, air, and soil, and helping to promote clean energy and a more div diversified economic transition options. Lastly, but not leastly, uh, we have Jill Watkins. Uh, if she, uh, I'm not sure if she's able to uh, still join in yet. Uh, but Jill is the owner of Watkins Design Works. Uh, it is an NCIDQ certified interior designer with nearly 30 years of experience in commercial interior design and over 20 years devoted to sustainable design. She earned a Bachelor of Science in Interior Design from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Uh, she has worked for several years uh, in interior design, architecture and engineering firms on a variety of commercial interior projects. She became one of the founding members of the Cleveland Green Building Coalition, uh, was chapter president of the International Interior Design Association in Ohio or slash Kentucky for four years and led the green effort for Gillette's uh, world, sa world Shaving Headquarters renovation that has since become part of Procter & Gamble's Green Building Standards. Jill is a certified interior designer in Maryland, Virginia, and Washington, D.C. Um, and is a professional affiliate member of the AIA West Virginia. So before uh, we get started, I want to ask each of the panelists to give some more in-depth background on themselves, their positions, and the companies in which they work. And we'll go ahead and start with Mr. Hollinsworth. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I'm retired. Our schools in West Virginia, uh, we had uh, about 70 schools and I was the director of maintenance. So energy management was a big part of my uh, responsibilities, uh, keeping utility bills down, as well as keeping the air conditioning units running and making sure creature comfort was there. Um, I was there for 16 years. Prior to that, I was with uh, Medico Security Locks in Salem, Virginia, as the facilities maintenance manager there, and I was there for 24 years. So I've done projects with environmental. Uh, I moved a company up in New York, and uh, but facilities maintenance is my background, and that's where I tend to live. Uh, so energy management is very near and dear to my heart since I've retired and been working with ASHRAE and helping systems 
benchmark their schools and uh, reduce their energy usage. So I'm um, looking forward to see what we have going today. Thank you. Next, um, we can go to Garrett. Garrett, if you want to give some of your background and information. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, Garrett Weaver with the Office of Energy. I, a little bit out of college, came into an internship through a competitive uh, state energy program grant through the office, and I worked uh, mostly through West Virginia ASHRAE with Terry a lot and other gentlemen named Art. And what I did was I benchmarked all of the K-12 schools all throughout the state. So that involved traveling to each and every one of the counties, talking to the respective administrators, getting them to participate in this voluntary program. And then uh, on from that, it kind of stemmed into an internship with the state where I kind of got to get a feel for more of the state energy programs and the federal funding that kind of came down from the Department of Energy. And uh, that's kind of where I stem to now, um, overseeing all the federal programs through uh, the Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act. So I'm excited to hear from everyone today. Thanks, Garrett. Uh, next, we'll move on to Robin. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Robin Blakeman. I'm the Director of Energy Efficient West Virginia. I should also say I am a Marshall graduate from the 80s which makes me kind of ancient. But um, anyway, I have um, for the past 14 years settled into the nonprofit sector of environmental and energy work in West Virginia. And that is a unique niche um, indeed. Um, and uh, so I want to speak from that perspective. Um, in the nonprofit sector, it's really important what your mission statement is. And so I'm going to share um, EEWV's mission statement with you. Our mission is to move energy efficiency forward in the mountain state by engaging community leaders and the public through advocacy and education. Our vision is to create policies and programs at the state and local level which create an energy efficient economy and utilize efficiency for an economic transition away from fossil fuels. We are joined in this endeavor by allied groups within the West Virginians for Energy Freedom Network. So within that statement, there's a lot encapsulated in a, that tells you a lot of what we do. We work in um, allied relationships with other groups, including um, Garrett's office and um, Terry's group, ASHRAE. Um, and full disclosure, Terry is actually the chairman of the EWV board as well. So, um, you know, we, all, we build relationships. We um, go around the state meeting with municipal leaders, uh, county commission leaders um, about how to make um, their buildings more efficient, how to, how to track their energy usage um, and the benefits of doing so. We see ourselves as a networking organization that brings information to the public about these things. We also work with the general public um, to, to provide them information on ways to take control of their energy costs. Thank you, Robin. Uh, next, we'll move on to Jill. Hi, everybody. Sorry, I'm a little bit late getting getting on here. Um, but my name is Jill Watkins and I own Watkins Design Works, which is a commercial interior design firm here in Charleston. And I also provide lead consulting services. And the most recent project I've worked on with lead specifically is um, the Charleston Coliseum and Convention Center, which was lead silver certified in 2020. And I worked pretty closely with uh, ZMM architects and engineers, the building owner, which is actually the city of Charleston, and also the um, the staff at the Civic Center itself to to gain an additional, I think, six points to get silver certified instead of the basic level of LEED certification. And um, I still attend the Green Build Conference every year and try to stay up on the current versions of the lead green building rating system and um I, and and the building codes in west virginia have actually kept up somewhat with with that program which is good um but i do try to incorporate 
not only energy efficiency and, and energy type um, products in my projects, but also more broad sustainability type approach. So it could be indoor air quality, bringing nature in in the term in terms of like biophilia, that kind of thing. Um, so we may get more into that as we get 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 into the program. Okay, thank you, Margie. Do you want to give a little bit of background on yourself? Sure. So uh, good afternoon to everyone. And my name is Margie Phillips. I'm an instructor in the management division here in the College of Business, but I also hold a couple other hats. I'm the director of enrollment management uh, and recruitment for the College of Business. And then lastly, I am the sustainability management and technology bachelor's degree program coordinator for the College of Business. Uh, this is my 10th year full time teaching in the College of Business. And prior to that, I was the sustainability and energy manager for Marshall for almost 20 years. So again, I wanna to wish to thank each of the panel members. I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. I think the information and the knowledge you each have and share will be incredibly valuable for our students' professional development. Um, this discussion portion is gonna be split into three segments. Uh, those being, first, opportunities in energy sector in West Virginia, finding a place in the energy sector in West Virginia, and lastly, Q&A time. Um, so we're going to get started, so let's get started. So this first section is called opportunities in energy sector in West Virginia. Um, the first two questions are for, it's an open for either of the four panelists to um, put their input into it. Uh, but the first question, what are some of the ways renewable energy is being brought to West Virginia? And what are some of the current methods being utilized? Um, so I open it up to the four panelists. Who would like to be first? No, oh, here. Sure. Terry, you want to be first? The first. For the question. I love it when everybody, when everybody freezes. <laughs> yeah, everybody's like, no, I'm not saying a word. <laughs> yes, please. Garrett, you want to go first for us? I, yeah, I could go. I was just sure if he was cutting out or not. Yeah. I know, um, in and out a little bit there. Yeah, I think a big way that renewable energy is being brought in the states actually through the businesses that um, kind of work with economic development, who my office is, my office is under. And some of those can include like Toyota, for example, is really big into the renewable energy sector. They bring in a lot of solar power to their facility up at Buffalo. And not only on top of that, they have a lot of environmental regulations that they follow very stringently and trying to be as efficient as possible. Um, in addition to a recent project that was announced last year with Berkshire Hathaway, they're going to bring the state's first 100% renewable powered microgrid manufacturing facility to the state. So I think that's really exciting to see how um, it kind of gets different entities that I work with and around thinking outside the box and ability to bring this kind of technology into West Virginia and get, get the residents and the different businesses thinking about it and the options that they can take. Absolutely. Um, Terry, you want to go next? Uh, yeah, and some of the things that we've been working with is uh, geothermal, uh, drilling down into the ground and, and where we have a constant temperature, 60 degrees. And uh, we've had schools where they've gone in and drilled uh, 250 wells and run pipe down through it like a big radiator and uh, circulate water through there. Uh, <clears throat> those 250 wells will go 400, 450 feet deep. And so they get a constant temperature and then run that water back through a uh, water source heat pump. And for one high school in Kanawha County, they were, they're saving $250,000 a year in their energy bill because they're using less gas and less electricity. Wow. So that, that's one of the things there's a, you know, as they build new schools, they're putting in geothermal systems at uh, uh, several new schools in the state, and it's really making a difference in utility usage or, or the reduction of utility usage. 
So I'm trying to keep up with the questions here. Uh, so Robin, you want to be next? Sure. Well, I'll get on my soapbox and say that, um, you know, energy efficiency has to come first um, because the, the more energy efficient that your buildings are, of course, the less solar panels or um, drill cores or whatever for geothermal you're going to need. And that's just a, a basic concept that we try to get out there that, you know, energy efficiency, while it's not quite as sexy as solar or some of the um, other uh, renewable energy is is has got a lot of potential in West Virginia to save people a lot of money and um, and cut their energy needs, um, first of all, um, and their energy cost. Um, and in that vein, um, you know, I'll also mention that West Virginia has some of the least efficient building stock in the country. And so that's why we feel like our role in this state is very important. Um, um, you know, we work to try to um, encourage the major utility providers, AEP and First Energy, to put instill programs that will um, lead to uh, adoption of more energy efficient usage um, uh, of things like insulation, et cetera in people's homes, uh, small businesses, and um, wherever people are using their energy. Um, we also know that the IRA benefits are include a lot of energy efficiency upgrades, HVAC units, uh, water heaters, et cetera. So, um, so we're trying to get the word out on that. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is that we do um, help people connect with our allies and Solar United neighbors and the major installers for solar in West Virginia when they mention that they want information on solar installations. And so, you know, we're again, a networking group. Okay, and lastly, Jill. I'm seeing um, some some action in the in transportation. So you're, you're hearing news about um, uh, alternative fuel buses for mm -hmm. some of the schools, um, you know, biofuel is still is still a hot commodity for the most part. Um, and the state uh, DOT is involved with the, the National Electrical Vehicle Infrastructure Plan. And you can go to DOT's website now and and see what the status is of that plan. But um, they are basically creating essentially electric corridors on the major interstates through the state um, where electric vehicles will have access to charging stations. You're already seeing that actually at all the state park lodges um, charging stations there. So I kudos to DNR for sort of being ahead of, ahead of the curve, um, knowing that, you know, sort of combining tourism <laughs> with with energy efficiency and really trying to attract uh, more people, whether they be Tesla owners or uh, other types of electric vehicles um, to our state. So I think I think that's all positive news in the right direction. And if we can get that uh, solar car charging station tax credit back like we used to have about 10 years ago, we'll be doing even better, I think. Wonderful. Um, let's go to question two. What are some of the beginning level entry points of your fields? What steps can students take to ensure advancement in those career paths? And are, are, are these opportunities attractive and typically available for fresh graduates looking for a secure path? So we'll start with Garrett again and do the same rotation. Yeah, I, I definitely think entry level positions are could be a lot higher in state level positions because we just have such a broad range of departments. I mean, not necessarily just in my office, but like Joe mentioned, like DOT works with energy, tourism works with energy, DNR does. We worked heavily with DNR um, to do that project that she was speaking of. So definitely big uh, entry and entry level jobs for college graduates. And even then, even if the job's not necessarily there, a lot of times the departments are willing to work. Like I came in as a intern 
through the Office of Energy. And I know a lot of times through federal funding, these different agencies are allowed to offer internships to students to come in to kind of get a feel what they'll be doing on day-to-day -day operations. So I definitely think that's a huge success on the state's part, utilizing the federal dollars so that students can get in and kind of fill on short internships, whether they want to um, be welcomed into it. Sounds great. We'll jump over to you, Robin. Okay, so um, Energy Efficient West Virginia doesn't directly have a role in uh, job creation, except for the fact that I'm now looking for a part-time outreach coordinator, if anyone's interested in that. And that is a way to get into the nonprofit sector, to, to join as an outreach coordinator or a community organizer, and then work your way up. Uh, to uh, being a director of an organization or a, a grant writer or, you know, whatever you're interested in. There's lots of roles out there um, that you could play in, in those fields. Um, I will say, though, that with the IRA benefits coming into this state, there are a lot of training programs available and a lot more demand for energy technicians, um, electricians, and um, energy auditors. And I'm sure that Terry and or Garrett might speak more to that because um, I know they're working on training programs for such people. Okay. Um, Jill, you want to go ahead and then we'll come back to Terry. Sure. Um, you know, my, my main focus th for my career has been architecture and interior design. So if you are interested in architecture and interior design, typically getting an internship would mean coming from um, a, a design school. Um, but as for engineering, there are quite a few engineering firms in West Virginia, especially um, like mechanical, electrical, plumbing engineers who would be focused more on the sustainability side of things. And especially if you're really interested in data, running calculations for building a energy use um, is something that's going to continue to grow, I think, as part of the design field. Um, LEED is getting more and more detailed <laughs> and requiring a lot more documentation than it did at the very beginning. And so as much as, as we can get down into the details of not only estimating energy use, but then tracking it over time is going to be important in the building sector. Absolutely. Um, Terry, how about you? And I apologize for I had to step away for a second. Um, a talk about entry level into the uh, energy field. A new one is it's new, but it's old energy auditing or energy auditors. Mm -hmm. uh, being able to come in to residential and or commercial, there's two different paths there uh, to audit uh, a home or a building's energy usage. And during this energy audit or uh, level one or level two and with ASHRAE, uh, they come in and identify things that you can do to improve your energy usage or, or energy reduction. And then, then they also identify your big hitters, your heavy users, where you can uh, put together a plan of replacing units, like a rooftop unit that's got a gas pack on it. You can replace it with a, a heat pump unit with geothermal or some other type of uh, systems that you can go through there. But the energy auditing on the front end is something new that's uh, also part of the Inflation Reduction Act. So there's opportunities there. Now, with the energy codes, one of the things that's required nowadays is commissioning. So you build a new building or you add on to a building or you upgrade the HVAC system. It's required now that a third party come in and do commissioning work. And that's to they come in and they run the units through all the, the paces and the control systems and they make sure that it works correctly. Commissioning is a big thing. It's already in yeah. DC. There's a, a contractor up there that's in the ashray and he's working seven days a week and he's got six employees. And he needs people. Yeah. So those are two big things, one on the front end for auditing, one on the back end for commissioning always HVAC repair 
you get a good repairman they can make really really good money and working in the state of west virginia doing hvac repair and going into the future as the climate warms up and the equipment becomes much more sophisticated yes it'll be like your cars when i was growing up we could go out and adjust our points and change the plugs and wires now if you don't have a computer you better not touch anything under the hood Mm -hmm. It's going to become like that with the rooftop air conditioners. They're going to have a laptop or an iPad and they're going to go up and they're going to plug in and they're going to get a diagnostic of what's wrong with that particular unit. So HVAC repair is going to need uh, and controls is going to need that. Understanding geothermal solar uh, transfer or photovolactic transfer of uh, light to energy and wind to energy. So geothermal to energy. So all these things are drilling wells, uh, installing rooftop units. It's all big. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Um, so let's look at question number three, Terry. This one's for you. Having decades of experience in the fields of energy management, safety, and the environmental part of it, uh, what are some of the ways students interested in the energy sector can find a job in energy management? You've kind of touched on that already. But are there many opportunities within the state? There's many opportunities. Uh, I know WVU offers an engineering program and uh, with HVAC, I know uh, Marshall has a program there that Garrett's a graduate of. And uh, there's so many opportunities coming with the Inflation Reduction Act of having um, apprenticeship programs set up in businesses, engineering groups is one of the requirements of to get IRA uh, funding or um, tax deductions. Mm -hmm. uh, there's in one commercial part of it, you can get 6% of the project cost back in a, as a tax deduction, or if you have a uh, prevailing wage apprenticeship program, then you can you increase that percentage of how much taxes you can get to uh, get in your returns. So that offsets some of your costs in uh, putting in uh, new units or upgrading your systems. So there's the opportunities there. Uh, it's the it's the I'm excited about what's happening in the field and where we're going it is going to in the next five years. Definitely. I, I've seen the change myself, so I know what you're talking about. Um, Robin, let's look at um, how do you how do energy efficient West Virginia employees work to encourage the adoption of policies that enhances energy efficient options? Who are some of the people, businesses, companies you talk to about these options? What options are there? Um, can smaller, newer businesses be part of these discussions? If so, what are the benefits? Well, um, you probably gave me just gave me an assignment that I could write a um, <laughs> research paper on. <laughs> probably. If I haven't done the research. Um, there are a lot of opportunities for um, small businesses to get engaged right now. In fact, um, with our coalition group that we work primarily with, uh, West Virginians for Energy Freedom, we are looking for small business partners in that organization. Um, and that organization is focused on policy decisions um, such as uh, rate cases or um, net metering cases at the Public Service Commission level or um, legislative efforts like community solar um, and that kind of thing at the um, West Virginia legislation uh, level. So, um, so we do work in coalition to try to influence our decision makers in the state. Um, we, we have um, a legal team um, that we um, work with to also intervene in certain cases like that. You need need that if you're going to really make an impact in West Virginia. Um, so, you know, working with those those lawyers and um, trying to gain citizens uh, in the state uh, support to uh, speak out at, at various hearings or legislative meetings or whatever 
Um, that's also something that we do um, on a regular basis alongside our allies in the state. Interesting. Um, okay, Jill, your turn. Um, you have 20 years dedicated to sustainability design. Uh, what are some ways you incorporate sustainability into your designs and what type of businesses do you work with? I work with lots of different companies, um, architects, uh, business owners. I've worked for state government, higher education. It's kind of all over the place. Um, and I try to look at projects holistically. So many times I'll, I'll start with the interior finishes. So looking at VOC levels in the paints that I specify. Um, maybe there's carpet tile that does not need adhesive to be installed. It can be installed almost like a free lay type system. Um, asking manufacturers hard questions like how they deal with waste or do they use recycled materials in their products? Um, I also tried to look at United States made products as often as I can. Um, can't really do that for everything, but really trying to look at sourcing on the manufacturing side and then how how manufacture where where things are manufactured in terms of is it going to cost a lot to, to ship it? You know, specifying a, a ceramic tile from China versus California has a lot of shipping um, implications, mm -hmm. and maybe I can find something that's made in Tennessee that is very similar and and just as good quality. Um, indoor air quality, some of the things I talked about you know, are affect indoor air quality, but then also looking at what we call biophilia. So bringing in nature, having views out, out a window of nature is great, but having indoor plants, even having a, a picture on the wall of a landscape or flowers or something like that actually improves well-being um, during the day. And since we all spend a good amount of time in our offices, um, I've been doing uh, health clinics and so bringing that kind of benefit of nature into the health clinics reduces stress and that kind of thing. So acoustics also is a big a big part of sustainability. Um, so there, there's definitely lots of ways to, to to look at a space holistically and bring as much benefit to the people that use the space and to the planet as well. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, let's go to um, the next section. So the next section is finding a place in the energy sector in West Virginia. Um, so this first question is open to all four panelists. What does West Virginia need to become a more sustainable state? What businesses or companies can bring can help bring clean energy to West Virginia, ooh, West Virginia, and how can our LCOB students contribute? So let's start with Terry. We'll just start down at the bottom here and go around. Well, yeah, I, I've got here in time to do what I needed to do. All right. Um, I touched upon a lot of this is, is in previous conversations here, but um, bringing sustainability to West Virginia, we just need people to work on these engineers to work on this, managers to work on this, to, uh, you know, people on the ground going out and getting meter numbers and tracking out uh, building square footages and get up on the roof and seeing how much electricity that they're using or gas that they're using and serial numbers and age and and uh, the uh, the amount of work is is astronomical of what needs to be done out there and as these uh your new grants and opportunities come down we're going to need people to fill those voids um, 
And oh. I, I've been retired for three years, but I've been staying busy for three years. So uh, working with schools and trying to get help them you know, benchmark their, I kind of took over when Garrett backed away and went on to other things. So um, that has been uh, really eye opening for me. And it's been a passion now to help West Virginia become better because we, we're definitely deserving of it. And we're uh, the, the work ethic in West Virginia is fantastic. Let's just let's make a difference for each other. I totally agree. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Terry. Um, Garrett. Yeah, uh, I completely resonate with what Terry says, in addition to definitely the people and then just um, educating the general public. Like, you know, say you find a passion in these fields, like um, my respective panelists and I do, it's just educating the public on what's out there because I have conversations with people every day like, oh, I didn't know that existed or I didn't know I could do this. It's just the, the simple things that can get the word out with it, especially in this time of historic funding from, you know, the federal government and everything. And also, I think it's um, you can you can um, become more stable by utilizing a holistic approach. And what I mean is, you know, we have our deep roots in what West Virginia is known for and how it always has. But um, there's ways to make those technologies more efficient as well, whether it's through carbon capture and utilization or, you know, embracing the new technologies as well. I know I mentioned a few businesses earlier, but another one to mention is Form Energy who's a battery manufacturer that came into the state for the first time. That's the first one the state's ever had. Right. And we also have a steel recycling facility about an hour north of Huntington that's going to be put in and the EV bus manufacturers. So definitely educating the public on those technologies. And what we're coming to find out is what's kind of found out in the past is even if you, you know, came off, you got laid off from the different industries, you still have the knowledge with just a few more things in between to work on these technology, the new technologies as well just the vast wealth of knowledge that the old technologies provided. Thank you, Garrett. Robin? So West Virginia has a vast potential for um, overall diversified energy um, production, whether it's solar on rooftops or whether it's increased energy efficiency that lowers the energy consumption of a specific building, whether it's geothermal, uh, wind, um, hydro, uh, micro hydro, uh, there are all kinds of businesses that could be and are being developed throughout this state. Um, so small business development is the first thing I would encourage your students to look into. Um, other, other areas that um, would be particularly good for West Virginia would be um, anything that benefits um, either older homeowners or lower income um, renters or homeowners. Um, you know, we're hearing some incredibly heart-wrenching stories from people who um, just can't afford these rising energy costs. Um, seniors who are having to make decisions between <coughs> literally buying food and their medicines or paying their electric bill um, and I talked to one woman recently whose water had been shut off and she couldn't afford to pay the, um, the water company the, the reinstallation fees because of her electric bill, which was also running higher than usual due to some rate increases that, uh, you know, our Public Service Commission authorized recently. So um, it's, you know, there's a great need. And it can be overwhelming at times. So, you know, I would not object to um, different chapters or small businesses that promoted energy efficiency and renewable installation cropping up all over the state. And I'm sure that not many of our businesses who are in that um, realm would either, such as, you know, Solar Hauler, which is one of our primary solar installers, um, Coalfield Development which also uh, trains people for solar installation, uh, brownfield redevelopment, et cetera. So we need more of those kind of innovative um, fields. So that's what I would encourage people to, to look towards. 
I totally agree with you, Robin. Uh, we do need those small businesses to, and they can grow into medium to large businesses. Um, so Jill, what's your... Uh, I, I would second, or I guess third, what Robin was saying. Um, yeah. You know, I think, you know, even if, if you're a chemistry major and you come up with a way to recycle different types of plastics into one plastic, one reusable material. Um, green chemistry is an sort of an up and coming field. And wouldn't it be great if our tech parks focused on green chemical companies coming in and doing that kind of research instead of sort of the old standbys. Um, and, you know, I, I have to say that we, we also need our political science majors <laughs> to get into politics because, you know, we're seeing that the PSC ruling on net metering is a step backwards because West Virginia had a pretty strong net metering law in place and we are moving backwards in that realm. Um, there used to be a lot more state tax credits for uh, solar panels, the solar car charging stations, mm -hmm. that kind of thing that are no longer on the books. So, you know, really getting involved with talking with your uh, state legislators, even our, con our congressional leaders um, and that kind of thing, you know, that alone is time consuming, but it does need to be, it does need to be done so that, so that those people know what's important to the constituents, you know, in this state. Thank you, Jill. All right, Garrett, you get question two. You help to oversee the planning and implementation of all federally funded programs in the state. What are some of those programs? And how can young entrepreneurs seek federal funding to incorporate renewable energy into their business? What are the benefits? Yeah. So um, some of the programs we currently oversee now are you're going to have the home energy rebates that bring energy efficient initiatives to homeowners, whether it's replacing electric um, breaker boxes or new HVAC. I mean, that list is, is long. There's EECPG that can help nonprofits and local governments reduce energy usage through energy efficient measures. Um, there's, I mean, there's there's a wealth of different initiatives that are coming down from the state right now. I think I tallied it up. There's over 10 plus programs equaling almost $2 billion. So it's definitely, definitely a historic time for people to get involved and definitely, um, definitely for if they're entrepreneurs and small businesses to reach out, they, they, you know, if they procure an old building, they need energy efficient retrofits for, I'm sure there's something out there that can help, whether it's through my office or through the additional funding that all the agencies that I work with um, additionally are having coming in, so. That's great, because I think we need that here in the state. Um, Jill, number three, um, are there many design companies like yours in the state? How did you get started to focus solely on implementing sustainable designs for your projects? There are architects and engineers throughout the state who are individually um, lead accredited professionals. S some of them are doing lead projects. Um, I can't say that there's any actual lead consultants in the state. I have not run into anybody that that's doing that kind of work, but there are still lead projects going on throughout the state. Um, and I got really interested in this around 1996. I saw a presentation by an architect uh, named John Picard and Google him. If you have a chance, there's some really great videos that he's done. Um, but that was at a time like before the internet really. And he was a consultant for the gap and came to the conclusion that they didn't necessarily need to build more stores because that used up materials transportation and that kind of thing that they could sell products online and obviously there's transportation issues with that as well but that was sort of the beginning of where we are now 
wow. with Amazon and that kind of thing. And so that I consider John Picard a futurist really as well um, for having that sort of insight and seeing how that can transform really society. And it would be interesting to know if retail establishments like the Gap had gone down the path as they were with building new stores or building new malls, what the sort of carbon impact of that would be versus the transportation costs that we have now with with Amazon. It, that would be kind of an interesting study. I, I don't know where it would be, you know, where it would end up at this point. Um, but there was also Oberlin, I lived in Cleveland at the time, and Oberlin College had just built an environmental studies building that was, again, before LEED, so I'm really dating myself now, too, um, and was really very green and very at the forefront of this sort of green building movement. So that was an inspiration as well. And so just through networking around that building, um, helped develop sort of a, a network of people. And I've talked to other people who were practicing architecture and design at that time. And it was the same all over the country. It was just one of those sort of waves of interest um, that's developed into the US Green Building Council and sort of where we are today. And I'm not I'm not trying to say that I had a hand in that or anything. It's just that I was in the right place at the right time. And that's usually how it works out. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. yeah. Yeah. Okay, we have one more question and it's a panel one, so it's open to all four. Um, so number four, everyone knows West Virginia utilizes wind, solar, and hydropower. But what are some of the other forms of renewable energy that's occurring within the state? So we'll start with you, Terry. One of the big ones, it's, it's kind of the air that everybody's starting to use now is geothermal. Mm -hmm. yep. Circulate water through uh, a radiator through the ground and, and maintain a 60 degree temperature and then go through a water source heat pump. So the heat pump takes heat out of the room and puts it into the water, to cool the room, and then it reverses later on and it takes heat out of the water to put in the room. So if it can maintain a 60 degree source of heat or cooling, it works great. It uses very little energy. Um, other options out there are, uh, uh, you know, mine pools is a big one. Uh, that's a big opportunity I'd love to see go. We've got abandoned mines with that are filled up with water. Those, those mines have 60 degree water in there. You can pump that water up through a plate and rack system and exchange uh, the cooling or the heating with a water system that circulates through the building that the two shall never meet, but it'll, it'll exchange over. So you can take that water, heat and cool it throughout the building and then pump that water right back down into the mine pool and just continue to recirculate it. Works wow. great. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a school system in uh, I think Webster Springs that, that has something similar to that, that was used, except for they were using an aquifer. They hit an aquifer when they were drilling. Ooh. So, that was uh, an excellent idea of, of renewable energy of old abandoned mines. Yeah. Uh, so let's utilize that. Um, I know Marshall did an extensive study on identifying all, all the abandoned mines, and uh, they're trying to do uh, get a grant now to uh, install one of those type systems in a school system somewhere. So I think that's the um, solar wind. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, that, I think that's through George Carrico's Brownfields program, I believe. It's through uh, Sieber. Sieber. Oh, never mind. <laughs> that's the Center for Business uh, Economic Research. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that is a project I'd love to see get going. Go ahead. Oh, you read? You want to add I'm, more terms? I'm finished. I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Garrett, how about you? Yeah, um, 
Yeah, you know, when I think of yeah, geothermal is really popping up in the in the state now. That's actually a partnership that we have through my office through a grant that we give them to identify those. So yeah, it's it's a definitely a lot of exciting work that I keep regularly updated with. And also, depending on your class, I know the classifications of renewable on this certain topic change back and forth. But uh, the moratorium on nuclear was lifted last year in West Virginia. So. Definitely exciting to see. We've had a couple of meetings with technologists who delve in the nuclear field. So that's kind of up to debate right now whether you can consider nuclear renewable or not. But I know a lot of people do. So mm -hmm. they do. I think those are the two the two big ones, other than you know the the top ones that have always been around. Okay. Um, thanks, Garrett. How about you, Robin? Well, so other than increased energy efficiency, which is going to decrease energy um, consumption, I'll mention a couple of subsets of solar that um, we support work on. And one is the development of microgrids around the state. We participated in a, a, a survey um, a series of survey sessions that the West Virginia Office of Energy um, co-sponsored and um, you know like to see those microgrids develop for increased sustainability all across the state and they would essentially provide um, backup power for a lot of places. Um, the other subset of solar work that we do is um, supporting legislation that would allow for community solar development in West Virginia. Right now that is not legal in West Virginia per se. Um, I believe Solar Holler has done some projects that are quasi community solar, but community solar is where panels would be installed in a central place in a local community, uh, local neighborhood, um, could be on a school, could be on a, a parking lot, uh, could be in an abandoned field or something like that, uh, parking garage, and that solar would be, um, you'd, you'd be able to use that as a mini power plant um, for some housing and or small businesses around that area. Um, but we need the legislation to go through um, for that to, to become legal. So that's, uh, that's what we'd like to see happen in this state. Okay, thank you, Robin. All right, Jill, you're it. <laughs> I guess I can't really add to it what's going on currently um, in West Virginia that, that everyone else has not already mentioned, but I know there is a good bit of research going on with fuel cells mm -hmm. and fuel cells, you know, the hydrogen economy is still pretty far off, but the benefit of using a fuel cell and, um, and hydrogen is that the byproduct is typically water. So <laughs> that's a lot better than smog and chemicals and whatever whatever else um, other byproducts from fossil fuels might be. Um, I think the the key for West Virginia will be to not um, develop those using natural gas, which would I think is our inclination. Um, but hydrogen can be developed using electrolysis or biomass. Um, and then I, I guess I would say that biomass probably should not be from uh, um, clear cutting forests. So I think that I think hydro cells, you know, or um, hydrogen fuel cells, I think are potentially um, going to be beneficial as a as a large source of power in the future. But there still needs to be a lot of research around it to make sure that we're not, you know, still relying on fossil fuels for them. Interesting. Um, okay, so I wish to thank um, the energy panel for taking time again today. I'm going to now turn the program back to Andrew for Q&A. Um, so again, thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank Andrew. you, guys. Yeah, um, if anybody in the audience wants to uh, submit any questions in the Q&A box, uh, we'll go ahead and um, start having our panelists answer those. I have a few questions uh, myself. So while people are thinking of some questions to ask, um, I have some. Um, so my first one is uh, West Virginia has a large opportunity for sustainable energy. Uh, and then I know you guys listed um, wind, hydro, solar and geothermal. Um, what would starting a business uh, look uh, look like and getting some of those industries uh, into the state? 
And then uh, Garrett, you might be able to answer this one. Could there be federal funding for starting a business like that? I can start off on that one. Yeah, some of the, um, I don't necessarily about specific federal funding that could help with it, but I do know a lot of time, a lot of things coming down from the BIL and IRA is tax credits to do certain things. So you have all the money coming down. Like I said, if you bought a historic building, you can redo the lighting, you can redo existing HVAC systems. I mean, that list is almost almost continuous and then you have the tax credits to go along with installing solar chargers installing solar on the building that kind of come down from that so it definitely definitely a good benefit to get in if you had an older building that used a lot of energy and that's what we're finding out from a lot of people who reach out to us it's that's what they need yeah. okay. do any other panelists have uh any yeah the the a program of uh, for low income people, say $40,000 a year or less, they have an opportunity to get on the spot um, rebates. Uh, if I understand it correctly. So if a, a person needed to buy a new heat pump for their house, they made less than $40,000 a year, they can get up to $8,000 for the purchase and installation of a heat pump system. Well, I just recently purchased and installed a heat pump system in my dad's house, which was 2,000 square feet, and it was $8,000. If you're making less than $40,000 a year, I'm probably sure you're not living in a 2,000 square foot house. You're probably living in something a little smaller. So uh, you can get an instant rebate right then and there. Basically, if you're making less than $40,000 a year, that's free. Plus, if you need to upgrade your electricity, you can upgrade your electricity. I think twelve hundred or twenty five hundred dollars for upgrading electricity. I think it's twelve hundred, mm -hmm. and uh, to upgrade your electrical panel to, uh, to accommodate the new heat pump. So, if you wanted to start an industry like yeah, say like uh, Huntington or Marshall Plumbing and Heating, and Marshall Plumbing and Heating would then cater to these uh, you know, low-income people, then this, this federal government through the IRA program will pay you, if you can be patient, wait on the check to show up, The uh, be patient, and, and you can get paid like that, and you can satisfy a lot of customers, and, and you know you're getting a guaranteed payment. So if you wanted to start a business, you know, catering to that, educating them, catering to it, providing it for them, insulation, windows, uh, uh, heat pumps, all that is covered. Even uh, a water, water some heat pump water make that nowadays, and it'll make 90 degree water. So huh. if you add a little bit of a, a instant heat to it for like a shower or something like that, it's less electricity. Okay. Thank you. you. Yeah. Uh, we have a question of opportunities for small businesses. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a question from uh, Coral Carnes. Uh, uh, they asked, uh, what is one thing you recommend we do uh, each day in our lives to lower our personal energy use? Who wants to be first? Robin? Suppose I can. Yeah, I can take that. Um, Turn out the lights <laughs> or change out your light bulbs um, and certainly keep uh, thermostats as low as you can in the winter and as high as you can tolerate in the summer. Um, you know, some simple things like that can save an awful lot of electricity. There's also the concept of, of um, what some people call ghost electricity, which um, people don't even think about. Um, older refrigerators that run practically all the time you change those out you can save a ton of electricity um, electronic devices that are plugged in and um, you know running in the background uh, also suck a lot of energy out of your your building or your home so um, just you know turning off some power strips or you know, changing out that refrigerator. If 
you know, you can afford it and, um, you know, wait on the savings that you get from your energy bills to, to help pay for it. It's, um, it's definitely worth considering doing. And the water heater rebates, uh, HVAC rebates that you can get right now are really worth looking into. Um, I believe Home Depot and Lowe's are developing um, information on their websites for such things. So, you know, check into those kind of things. But do the simple things at least, you know, put some door stripping around your door, um, put some plugs in your outlets and your light switches, you know, do whatever you can. I would, I would add open your windows in the spring and fall when the weather's nice and turn off your heater, your HVAC or your air conditioner. Um, can't do that all the time, obviously, but it's kind of nice. And then the other thing I was going to mention is to walk someplace to run errands. Like maybe maybe you don't normally walk to Kroger's, but if you go out for lunch, maybe you just need a couple things from the grocery store or the drugstore or something, and you can walk another quarter mile or, or half mile to do that instead of driving there after work during rush hour or something. So mm -hmm. trying to limit as much driving as you, as you can. Again, that's hard to, we live in a pretty hilly area for the most part, um, but it's kind of, it's nice to do that every now and then. Yes, it is. It's, anyone else have a comment? Okay. Um, we have another one. Um, they said that you may have mentioned this in the video or in, in the panel, but do any of you uh, do internships or job shadowing for students? I don't have anything personally going on right now that that would help students, but hopefully some of the others panelists do. Yeah, I mean, we don't have any direct things right now that you can necessarily apply to. But like I said, I came in through an internship program, so the, the opportunity definitely exists in a broad sense if students are interested. And, and I've been talking to engineering firms in the last couple of days about uh, the energy auditing uh, part of it. Uh, that print, you, you can get apprenticeship program. Uh, you know, these companies are looking or it, if this IRA takes off and if the state buildings take off for energy audit level one or level two, then uh, they're going to need people to go out and do these things. And uh, so, yeah, you know, put your applications out there or volunteer. So these companies, sometimes they can uh, you know, help you out with that and just get the experience you need to, to make it happen. True. And then Robin does have a position open. I think you know, the students that are here. And <laughs> I, I did mention that. that. Yeah, I have a, a part time outreach coordinator position open and we may be actually hiring some more um, at least one more person later in the year for something called a circuit rider position, which would be someone who would go around to various cities and towns um, and uh, do some assessments and um, entry da data entry kind of thing. So, you know, uh, I can throw my email into the chat. But um, beyond that, I was going to say um, if you're interested in combining your college degree with an electrician certification to, to do something like energy auditing or upgrade work, uh, start your own business, um, IBEW would be the place to look. They have internships that actually pay you while you work. Um, so check into the IBEW union um, office closest to your location. I know there's one in Huntington, there's one in Charleston, probably in other parts of the states as well. Thank you. Uh, Terry, I know you uh, touched on this a little bit, um, or Garrett too. Um, can homeowners receive any tax credits or rebates for installation of things like solar panels in their houses? And uh, are, there many, are, are there many businesses in West Virginia that do that? Uh, yes and yes. Uh, yes, you can get rebates for that. I, Garrett would know more about where the state is about getting approval for the plan. 
here in West Virginia and where that is with the IRA and but there's two solar companies, maybe three that I'm aware of. Two of them are definitely in the state. One, a third one is in yeah, so kind of do solar panel installations. And uh, I know uh, we mentioned Solar Holler earlier. Solar Holler went into a purchase uh, agreement program with Wayne County Schools, and they're putting in solar panels on all um, yeah. uh, rooftops for the schools of Wayne County. Yeah. going to provide them with all the electricity they need from solar power. It's very exciting. Oh, yeah. Yes, I mean, the, the Inflation Reduction Act, or also known as the IRA, is going to be an absolutely huge program for homeowners and businesses to do this. And some of it is income-based and some of it's not. So it's it gives a wealth knowledge of um, people who can apply for it. And then we are still currently in the planning, early planning phases of that as it's such a large program. I think in total, West Virginia is set to receive almost $90 million spread out over five years to benefit homeowners. So it's very exciting to see that. And then, yeah, there are a few that I know of too, Solar Hauler, there's um, Revolt Energy and Mountain View Solar. They're kind of spread throughout the state as different solar companies that do this. And then there's plenty more. I just, that's the ones I can think of off the top of my head. Thank you guys. I think someone's typing in the chat in the Q and A. That might be where I just put my contact information in there, and oh, okay. I'm not sure. Um, but I should also mention that Margie and I have discussed, and Terry's been in on these conversations too, um, assisting a certain um, large nonprofit in, in the Huntington area with some benchmarking. Um, that would be the Woodlands Retirement Center. Um, so if anyone in this, this audience is interested in doing that, we could set up a job shadowing uh, Kind of short-term internship project there with that that work that needs to be done and they're very interested in getting it done we have another one uh what is something you like best about your career he wants to go first on this one <laughs> i start with jill she's smiling big <laughs> I like uh, the creative aspect of my work and every day is different. Um, and I like to think that I improve the quality of life for my clients. So that's that's a big plus. I agree on that one. How about you, Terry? Um, me, it's, it's uh, of course, I come from a maintenance background, so fixing things is a big plus for me uh in the last couple of years though seeing schools improve their energy conservation has been a big plus for me and it, it just gives me why to get up every morning yeah uh, i'd say mine is just the vast knowledge and, and depth of that i can go with different things i mean i'm not doing what i was six months ago and i doubt i'll be doing now what i'll be doing six months later so just the continuous growth and the ability and definitely as a public servant in west virginia helping west virginians in energy efficiency measures and just making shining a light on the state that sometimes is can be missed and robin you want to take up the last there for us Sure, I, I like bringing good news and, and hope to people. Um, it's, uh, it's often funny how the simplest things can, can bring people hope and excitement. Um, I had a bunch, I mentioned outlet plugs or, or light switch plugs, which are little foam inserts that you put in those, you know, things we use every day and don't think about outlets and light switches to um, block drafts. And uh, I had some of those at a recent um, event that drew in a lot of low income people in, in Charleston. And people were so excited to get those outlet plugs or light switch plugs, uh, you know, and, and a little bit of door stripping or whatever. It's like, you know, something they can do to try to lower their energy bills just a little bit, you know, so bringing people hope and, and good news about what they can do is, is a good part of my job. Definitely. 
All right. Well, I think that wraps it up. Uh, I want to thank you all for uh, joining us today. And um, I really appreciate you guys hopping on here to kind of share a little bit about yourselves and uh, your perspective backgrounds and everything. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, James, for attending. Thank you. Thank you.